Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Oxford Interfaith Forum monthly interfaith psalms reading and discussion on Psalm 88, Fists Flailing at the Gates of Heaven with Rabbi Dr. Shai Held. Please allow me to remind you to keep your microphone muted unless you are speaking. We would also greatly appreciate if you would type questions in the chat if you have them, or you may also use the rise hand icon during the Q&A portion of our meeting. Now I would like to introduce the chair of today's session. Dr. Georgina Jardim is a senior fellow of the Center for Muslim Christian Studies, Oxford. She is also research associate of the University of Gloucester with a special interest in scriptural reasoning and the intersection of gender and religion. She has published on the topics of female characterization in the Bible and Quran and has produced a brief analysis of Muslim women's role in the anti apartheid struggles in South Africa. Her current work includes editing a volume on reading the Gospels in Islamic context and contributing an entry in the Brill series, Christian Muslim Relations, a bibliographical history about the 19th century explorer, David Livingston's relationships with Muslims during his travels in Southern Africa. Welcome, Dr. Jardim. Thank you very much, Erica. It is my privilege to introduce our speaker for tonight. Rabbi Shai Held is a theologian and educator he is president and dean at Hadar. He has taught both theology and Jewish law at the Jewish Theological Seminary and also served as director of education at Harvard Hillel. A 2011 recipient of the prestigious Covenant Award for Excellence in Jewish Education, Rabbi Held has been named multiple times to Newsweek's list of the 50 most influential rabbis in America. He holds a doctorate in religion from Harvard. His main academic interests are in modern Jewish and Christian thought, in biblical theology, and in the history of Zionism. Rabbi Held's first book, Abraham Joshua Heschel, The Call of Transcendence, was published by Indiana University Press in 2013. The Heart of Torah, a collection of essays on the Torah in two volumes, was published by JPS in 2017. His next book that you can look forward to is Judaism is about love. And this will be published by Farah Strauss and Giroux in 2023. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you, Rabbi Held, on this Psalm, Psalm 88, which is perhaps known for the only one not ending with a sense of hope or trust, but it starts by addressing God as the one who saves. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. It's a, a privilege to be able to, to study with this group. Before I say anything at all about this psalm, I'd love us to just listen to it. So I'm going to ask Shoshana if she could read the psalm for us in Hebrew and then Erica to read it to us in English in the JPS translation, the new JPS translation, and then we'll take it from there. Shoshana, whenever you're ready, great. Yes. Shir mizmol vnei korach limnatech al machalat la'anot maski lehimane izrachi. Adonai Elohai Yeshuati, yom sakati belayla negdecha, Satani <laughs> Bimsolot, Alai Samcha Hamatecha, Vaal Mashbaratai Rayek Anita Sela. Her Hakne me you die me many, Satani to a vote Lamo, Kaluk Velo etse, Enei Dava Mani Oni, Karatiha Adonai, Bacol Yom Shetakti Aleha Kapai, 
Halam meti ta se fella, halametim ta se fella, im refaim ya kumo yo duha sela. Ha ye supar be kever has decha be munatrecha ba avdon, ha ye vadabo hoshek palecha visitracha be eritz nishi a. Vani e lecha adonai shava a tea, be boker te filo te fila tea, tikad mat mecha. Lama adonai tis nach nafshi, tastir panecha mi meni. Oni an oni ani vago vea me no ar nasati ematha afuna alai avru haro necha vaovo techa samutu tuni zavuni kamayam kola yom hakifu alai yachad herchak de me many o heva rea miudai machshach. Erica, whenever you're ready. A song, a psalm of the Korahites for the leader on Mahalat Leonoth, a maskil of Haman the Ezraite. O Lord God of my deliverance, when I cry out in the night before you, let my prayer reach you, incline your ear to my cry, for I am sated with misfortune. I am at the brink of Sheol. I am numbered with those who go down to the pit. I am a helpless man, abandoned among the dead like bodies lying in the grave of whom you are mindful no more and who are cut off from your care. You have put me at the bottom of the pit in the darkest places in the depths. Your fury lies heavy upon me. You afflict me with all your breakers, Salah. You make my companions shun me. You make me abhorrent to them. I am shut in and do not go out. My eyes pine away from affliction. I call to you, O Lord, each day I stretch out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the shades rise to praise you, Salah? Is your faithful care recounted in the grave, your constancy in the place of perdition? Are your wonders made known in the netherworld, your beneficent deeds in the land of oblivion? As for me, I cry out to you, O Lord, each morning my prayer greets you. Why, O oh Lord, do you reject me? Do you hide your face from me? From my mouth, I have been afflicted and near death. I suffer your terrors wherever I turn. Your fury overwhelms me. Your terrors destroy me. They swirl about me like water all day long. They encircle me on every side. You have put friend and neighbor far from me and my companions out of my sight. Thank you both. Um, Psalm 88 is obviously and undoubtedly one of the darkest of the Psalms. Um, one scholar refers to it as, quote, the most desperate of all laments. Martin Marty describes it as, quote, a wintry landscape of unrelieved bleakness. And another scholar writes that the text is unrelieved by a single ray of comfort or hope. Yet one of the things I wanna suggest is that Psalm 88 is even bleaker and more desolate than most scholars seem to realize or permit. Um, in a recent article, um, David Howard goes so far as to refer to Psalm 88 as the mother of all laments. And in terms of its bold and unapologetic and almost brazen voice that it gives to human grief, it may well be. And yet, as Howard himself acknowledges, Psalm 88 stands out as much, if not more, for how it differs from other Psalms of Lament as for how it typifies them. So to get us started in thinking about this Psalm, I wanna just very briefly take stock of these divergences from the standard structure of a Psalm of Lament. And that will actually help us, I think, understand what is going on in this text and why it might be so powerful. So think for a minute about Gunkel's famous enumeration of the common features of lament. So among the features he mentioned were an invocation, a complaint or a characterization of the predicament in which the psalmist finds himself, an appeal for help, appeals and curses against enemies, sometimes coupled with hopes for the faithful, motivations for God to intervene, 
expressions of trust, articulations of certainty of being heard, and a vow of future action. Now, in order to be categorized as a lament, a psalm need not contain all of these elements. However, it is really striking when you take it to heart the list I've just given, how many of these characteristics are missing from Psalm 88? Psalm 88 contains no explicit appeal for help, which Gunkel considered, by the way, the most important element in a Psalm of Lament. It, it expresses no trust, and it does not give voice to a certainty of being heard, nor is there a vow to praise when the psalmist is saved. Most critically, the core arc of the lament, the movement from lament to praise, is totally absent here. The psalm ends where it lives, in total darkness. So another way to come at this is to consider some of what is conventionally said about psalms of lament, and then to think about how different the psalm is even from that. Richard Clifford, for example, says that laments could more aptly be referred to as petitions. This is his language now, since their purpose is to persuade God to rescue the psalmist. In Psalm 88, though, I would suggest, petition is actually quite marginal if it is present at all. If anything, the psalm is relentlessly focused on the ways that God has failed to respond to the psalmist's repeated petitions for deliverance until now. One more way of thinking about this. Klaus Westermann emphasized the importance of the vav adversative in the Psalms of Lament. He suggested that that vav introduces a turning point where lamentation gives way to a confession of trust or an assurance of being heard. The but, he said, his words now, designates the transition from petition to praise. Yet, in this psalm, the vav does not do that, but does its very opposite. It leads into one final outpouring of lament, this one all the more insistent that God has rejected the psalmist despite his constant pleading. This is verse 14, 15. But as for me, I cry out to you. Va'ani, elecha Adonai shivati. As for me, I cry out to you. Why, O Lord, do you spurn me? Lama Adonai tiznach nafshi. Westermann maintains that in the Psalms of the Old Testament, this is an amazing statement, quote, there is no or almost no such thing as mere lament and petition. The cry to God is always underway from supplication to praise, end quote. That may be true most of the time, but I think it is decidedly not true here. As the subversive um, use of the vav adversative here, of that vav shows, Psalm 88 constitutes a dramatic, and I will try to argue, deliberate exception to Westermann's rule. Psalm 88, in other words, what I've been trying to show in light of the comparison to Gunkel and the ways that this is different from the way both Clifford and Westermann describe, this, describe what a lament is, Psalm 88 tries to strip away the glimmers of hope that we might conventionally associate with the Psalms of lament. Now let's think about this a little more deeply. Just how deep is the rupture between the psalmist and God? An array of scholars, and Georgina alluded to this in handing the, the floor over to me, finds in verse 2's Elohei Yeshuati, God of my salvation, a hint of praise, a hint of hope, I guess you could say, and even praise. So to take one example, Marvin Tate writes that praise seems far away from Psalm 88, but in reality it is not. It even glimmers in the opening affirmation, Hashem, the God of my salvation. Others suggest, by the way, amending this text away from the phrase Elohei Yeshuati and instead Elohei Shivati, my Lord, I cried out. That emendation would help establish parallelism in an otherwise difficult verse, but to the best of my knowledge, there are no manuscripts that support that reading. More than that, though, if one thinks that Elohei Yeshuati introduces a glimmer of hope into a very dark psalm, amending the text eliminates that glimmer altogether and um, essentially turns it into one more desperate plea. 
I would like to offer a different alternative for how we should read Elohei Yeshua T, not as a statement of praise or of hope, and not as a misreading for what should say Elohei Shivati, but rather I'd like to suggest that the phrase Elohei Yeshua T is used by this psalmist ironically. After all, the God to whom he calls has been anything but a God of deliverance to him. Now, if the idea that the psalmist may be speaking ironically seems far-fetched or a stretch to you, consider some of what follows. Okay, now I want to just briefly point out some of the really interesting uses of irony that pervade this text. First, if you look at verse 4, Sav'avira'ot nafshi, I am sated with misfortunes, that phrase is clearly ironic, since it is usually some form of goodness or blessing that one is sated with. See, I don't know, Psalm 63, I am sated with, as with a rich feast. To announce oneself sated with sorrows is obviously, I think, to speak in an ironic mode. Second, the opening of verse 6, Bameitim chofshi, is extremely elusive, right? I mean, it's totally not clear what that means. But some have suggested that the psalmist says this ironically because he is free only from everything that makes life meaningful or compelling. That's quite a notion of freedom. Here, I love John Golden Gay's observation that free should be compared to the expression let go, used in business contexts to describe someone who wants to keep on working but is no longer wanted. It's exactly, I think, the valence of the word free here, chofshi. Third, the use of the word samcha in the accusation of verse 8, alai samcha chamatecha, is jarring, since the root samach often calls to mind God's faithful and steadfast support. These three examples, and there are others, that suggest, I think, that the psalmist is hardly a stranger to irony, and that he is not afraid to employ it in direct address to God. So in other words, whether God really is Elohei Yeshua T, the God of my salvation, is one of the questions that I think most agonizes him. By the way, I'll just mention a fourth irony. I think the phrase gever ein ayal, I am a man without strength, can also be taken ironically. The term gever suggests vigor and strength. The psalmist is, just a, is thus a man of strength and vigor, devoid of ayal, strength and vigor. That is really powerful, actually. So as these examples of irony mount, as you kind of build the list, you realize that the psalmist is kind of unabashed in calling God to account. And in a subtle way, the psalmist says so explicitly. He reminds God that he has been praying constantly, incessantly, and he says, Baboker tfilatite kadmeka which JPS renders as each morning my prayer greets you. That's verse 14. But the Hebrew tikad mecca can be taken neutrally, but it doesn't need to because tikad mecca can also suggest hostility and confrontation, as in Psalm 17. Kuma Adonai, kadma fanav, raise up or um, rise up, rise up, O Lord, confront him. Um, I wonder whether that meaning is at least hinted at here as well. The psalmist has not uttered gentle hymns, hymns each morning, but has accosted God and pleaded his case with passion and perhaps no small degree of fury too. In this context, I'm reminded of a, of a nice observation from Clint McCann that the psalmist's use of three different words for crying out, sa'ak, kara, and shava, serve to indicate that he has exhausted every possible approach to God. Now, the strife, the battle, if you will, between the psalmist and God is brought to the surface by another anomaly in this text. In Psalms of Lament, we typically expect to encounter three parties, the psalmist, the enemies who plague him, and the God he prays will save him. But Psalm 88 lacks any mention at all of human enemies. And although I'm less confident about this point, I think it's interesting to wonder whether the reason the enemies are absent here is because God has been cast in the role of the enemy instead. After all, it is God who is declared responsible again and again 
and again and then again for the psalmist's woes. So now we should ask why the breach between the psalmist and God is so profound. And here's where I hope if I have a, an original contribution to make, it's in an understanding what's going on in this psalm. Psalms of lament depend on a long-standing relationship with God. Part of what animates them um, is the fact that they have a past with God to draw on. Although the psalmists find themselves mired in affliction, as a rule, they're confident, and they know from experience, that the God to whom they appeal is faithful and steadfast. Even a psalm as radical as Psalm 44, which, if you pardon me, an American, I, th I think an American piece of slang, is unafraid to get in God's face, right? Begins, of course, with a recollection of just what God did for Israel in earlier times. As the psalmist situation was once these psalms implicitly suggest, so they can be again. With this in mind, I would like to suggest that the key word of this psalm has been largely overlooked by most commentators, both academic and traditional. Towards the end of the psalm, we learn something crucial about the psalmist's life, something that forces us to see his misery in a whole new light. The psalmist's present predicament is not an anomaly for him. He is not wrestling with a new unforeseen torment after a lifetime of well-being and contentment. On the contrary, he has been, and here's the phrase which to me is the key, he has been govea minoar, dying since youth. That is, he has been forced to endure lifelong, crushing, chronic illness. It is one thing to struggle with acute illness after a lifetime of health, but it is totally another to grapple with debilitating illness when it's long standing. In theological terms, what I'm suggesting is that the psalmist's problem is not that God seems to have suddenly abandoned him after long years of protecting him, but rather that God forsook him a very long time ago and that his life has been in some sense defined by this forsakenness. Now I'm aware, by the way, I should just mention this, it's possible to take illness here as metaphor as it is in many Psalms, but even if one does, the situation is not changed all that much. Namely, the point is that the person here has been, has felt or been abandoned for a very long time. There is no memory as in Psalm 44 in his life to turn to. Now let's just make this, I, I think it might be helpful to make this a little more human. Imagine a strong, loving, durable marriage that suddenly runs aground, and then compare it to a lengthy marriage that has been fractured for decades. It's obviously far more difficult to find a basis for hope in the second scenario than in the first. The psalmist's relationship with God is more akin to an irreparably broken marriage than to a fundamentally solid one that has suddenly reached an impasse. It would be difficult, I think, to overstate the importance of that distinction. The psalmist in Psalm 88, to at the risk of belaboring this point, has no personal past to which he can turn for hope and assurance. Even if we take his invocation of God as the God of my salvation at face value, which again, I don't think we should, the psalm unfolds in a way that mimics the way his life is unfolded. By the time we have encountered the ongoing litany of suffering and woe, which he has been forced to endure, the God of my salvation, Elohe Yeshuati, is little more than a distant and faded memory. For all intents and purposes, the only God the psalmist knows is a God who inexplicably is wrathful and abandons him. The fact that we learn of the chronic nature of the psalmist's suffering only near the conclusion of it is jarring, and I would actually suggest devastating. Perhaps as a reader, we had held out hope for him, and by extension, as people who pray for ourselves. Perhaps we were put off by the unrelenting nature of his complaint. Surely life is not all bleakness, to go back to that phrase from Martin Marty. Life is not entirely heartache. And then it, he, hits us. Life has been this way for as long as he can remember. His lament 
reflects the reality of his life. The misery and the suffering just go on and on. At the end of the tunnel, there is only more darkness. I want to make one kind of literary observation here, which I borrow from Erich Zenger. It is worth noting how the opening of each of the three sections of the psalm, that is verses 2 to 10, verses 10b to 13, and 14 to 19, at the beginning of each section, the divine name moves backward one place in the sequence of words. That is to say, verse 2 begins with Adonai Elohei Yeshuati. The yud Hey vav Hey there has the first place. Verse 10b begins with Karaticha Adonai. It has the second place. And verse 14 with Va'ani Lecha Adonai Shivati, it has the third place. As Zenger actually puts it, and here I just want to quote him, the invocation presented in all three sections with the Tetragrammaton underscores the intensifying drama. The hiding of God's face that is complained of in verse 15 is literally put into words. In other words, now this is me talking again, the more the psalmist prays, the further away God seems to be. That is a religious experience that is worth talking about, that is maybe surprising to conventional piety, that we could find that in a psalm. But the more passionately I pray, the more God seems to fade away into the background. Subtly and yet palpably, God's abandonment of the psalmist is rendered concrete by this text. Strikingly, I think, as the psalm progresses, the psalmist effectively ceases to petition God. He stops asking for anything. And what appears to be the psalm's one and only explicit petition, in verse 3, the psalmist implores God, which JPS, the new JPS, renders as, let my prayer reach you, incline your ear to my cry. By the way, it's worth noting, if only in passing, that I guess you could interpret verse 3 as a memory of past cries for help, mentioned in verse 2, rather than a present-day prayer, in which case the psalm would be completely devoid of petition. But in any case, by the time you get to verse 10, Kraticha Adonai B'chol Yom, I call to you, O Lord, each day, more than petitioning, the psalmist is complaining about God's stubborn inaction in the face of his own constant outpouring. The same applies, too, to verse 14. Va'ani elecha Adonai shivati. But as for me, I cry out to you, O Lord. The psalmist is praying, but he's not really petitioning, so much as remembering and reminding God, no, no less crucially, just how fruitless his long history of petitioning has been. Now, there's another dimension of this that I want to at least mention, which is, in a number of Psalms of Lament, I think, the pain of being distant from God comes coupled with the agony of being socially isolated. I think, for example, of Psalm 42, 43, where the psalmist complains of being far from God in God's temple, but also expresses the fact that he simply misses the festive throng with whom he once walked in festive pilgrimage to Jerusalem. That's Psalm 42, 5. For him, the sounds of joyous shouts of praise has been replaced by the very different sound of breakers and billows sweeping over him. For the psalmists to be separated from God, not sure how to say this, either simply is to be separated from God's people, or at least is bound up with being separated from God's people. Psalm 88, I want to suggest, picks up on this theme and forcefully amplifies it. If you'll pardon a colloquialism, it puts this theme on steroids. Not only has God unleashed God's fury on the psalmist, but God has turned his friends, those who might have comforted him in his affliction, away from him, making him repulsive in their eyes, a to'eva in their eyes. Those of us stricken with chronic illness know this frustration well. Just when we need our friends most, they move on, forgetting the depths of our suffering, or perhaps if we're honest, simply being frightened off by it. It does not seem, I think, much of a stretch to connect repulsion at illness with fear of it. More than that, the psalmist is shut in, feeling imprisoned by his body and abandoned by his companions. He is desolated by his isolation. <laughs> 
And so the question I think arises, where does this psalm leave us? Where do we end up as readers or as prayers when we read through this psalm to the end? The concluding verse is a crux. It's difficult to know how to punctuate, let alone translate it. The two final words might mean, this is JPS, my companions are in darkness. Sorry, that's NRSV. Or darkness is my closest friend. That's the NIV. Although I can't make a compelling grammatical argument for it, or for that matter, for any other of these readings, I am drawn to the suggestion that we take the Hebrew to be interrupted after me you die, um, thus yielding, you have caused lover and friend to shun me, my companions, darkness. However, we render the final phrase, I think, the key point is that, like it or not, the psalm ends with forsakenness. To go back to Georgina's introduction, not hope, but forsakenness. Now, what are we to make as Jewish, Christian, Muslim, whatever it might be, readers of this agonized prayer? Many writers, both scholars and popular writers, insist that, a, that in this psalm, despite the grave doubt and the rage that it expresses, there is great, even heroic faith here. Think, for example, of an article by Kathleen Harmon, who writes, and I want to quote this because I think it's both really interesting and also unsettling. While Psalm 88 may appear to indicate loss of faith, it actually does quite the opposite. The very act of speaking to God when God does not respond is an expression of profound faith. The person who no longer believes would simply walk away. Now, I think this is true as far as it goes, but it raises a question rarely asked, if ever, by especially Christian scholars who write on the Psalms. Just what does the psalmist's faith consist of? What is this word faith exactly? Faith is obviously a word that means many things to many people. And I wonder how helpful it really is to use it without attempting to flesh out what we mean by it in context. To be more concrete, the psalmist may still have something we'd want to call faith in God, but does he still trust in God? In Jewish language, you might say he has emunah, but does he have any bitachon? Does he see God as reliable and faithful? Can there be genuine faith devoid of trust? The answer might be yes, but it seems odd not to even consider the question. More fundamentally, at this late date in the psalmist's life, does he still harbor hope that God will intervene to save him? Now, I admit, and I think there's something powerful about this, given the intensity and duration of his suffering, given how many desperate prayers to God have gone unanswered, it is a wonder that the psalmist goes on praying at all. In other words, despite his anger and his disappointment, the psalmist refuses to sever his connection with God, or I wonder whether I should say refuses to allow God to sever his connection with him. God may hide God's face, but the psalmist will go right on talking because otherwise he really will be utterly alone. In a sense, the psalmist ceaseless talking about God keeps God's present, keep, keeps God present, even as the actual subject is God's ostensible absence. There's something there, I think, that is quite rich. If you talk about God's absence in a nonstop way, you make God, God present, even and especially in the midst of God's absence. Now, I want to conclude with a kind of ambivalent and somewhat puzzled theological postscript to this. The author of Psalm 88 assumes, I think, a very active, um, a, a very active providential hand at work in his life, right? He never seems to doubt God's active omnipotence in managing the affairs of the world. God alone, I think you could say from this Psalm, is the source of his suffering and God alone can be the source of his deliverance. For many modern readers, and I'll admit for me too, all of this raises an array of difficult questions. What kind of God do we need to believe in and what notion, if any, of divine providence do we need to have in order to utter these Psalms with integrity? 
if we don't believe that God actively runs the world, or even if we don't believe that God runs the world in quite so micromanaging a way, can the Psalms of Lament still have a place in our religious lives? The Psalmists cry out to God because they believe that God can relieve their suffering. They don't just want to be heard. They want to be answered and saved. The primary purpose of lament in biblical times was not catharsis, but salvation. This leads some biblical scholars to suggest, here I'm quoting from a recent book by Scott Ellington about the Psalms of lament, that prayers of sorrow and complaint that expect no concrete answer have no point of contact with biblical lament. Now that seems a little too strong to me, even though I think the point behind it is, is worth grappling with. In lament, regardless of response, suffering is still given the dignity of language. Suffering can render us passive, voiceless, mute. And in reading Psalm 88, I'm reminded of a influential essay by Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, who teaches that there is something inherently redemptive about finding words for our pain. He writes, a mute life is identical with bondage. A speech endowed life is a free life. So what I, what I hear in that is that even before they are saved by God, or even for that, matters in, for that matter in situations where they aren't saved by God, the psalmists accomplish something transformative simply by giving voice to their afflictions. And I say this even if they themselves would have said, but that's not good enough. There is something redemptive in their vocalization of their pain and their sorrow, even if they themselves would have said, solidarity is no replacement for salvation. In our own time, I think many of us are more confident of God's solidarity or presence than we are of God's salvation. That may indeed represent a vast gap or even a chasm between us and our biblical forebears. And yet, I think, and with this I'll end, they have bequeathed us something precious and potentially transformational. The insistence that we need not lie about our suffering, the awareness that honesty is never a sacrilege, and the courage to cry out, the confidence that injustice is to be resisted rather than accepted. I'll maybe say one, one additional sentence here. Soloveitchik speaks of the redemptive power of petition. To give voice to our need is to some degree to redeem ourselves. That's Soloveitchik, the existentialist speaking. What I'm suggesting somewhat tentatively is that what Soloveitchik says about petition may be true about lament as well. When we full-throatedly declare that our suffering is too great to bear, and when we without embarrassment insist that we do not deserve the anguish that we endure, we participate in some way, perhaps it's a small way, perhaps it's a large way, I'm honestly not sure, in our own redemption. This has a psychological dimension, but it has a powerful relational and theological one as well. If suffering can make us feel passive and victimized, lament can restore our sense of dignity and agency. In mustering the audacity to speak to God in this way, the psalmist and we who recite his words declare against all evidence to the contrary that we matter. We matter both to ourselves and to God. And that is decidedly not nothing. I'm going to stop there and take questions and responses. Thank you so much, Rabbi Held. Um, I think I will use the words of uh, one of our participants in, in the chat, uh, Carenza, who said that this is a what she calls a fabulous reading and one that speaks into the experience of those who feel abandoned and distraught by chronic illness, or she adds sustained poverty. Um, mm -hmm. I think she asks mm -hmm. perhaps a rhetorical question when she says, does it need to be illness if poverty or other afflictions such as childlessness are understood as signs of abandonment. Right. Well, th this is what I meant when I when I suggested um, that the illness can be taken metaphorically. I mean, one of the things I, I'm not telling this group anything it doesn't know, but one of the things that I think is really interesting about the artistry of Psalms in general is that they refuse to be too concretely pin downable 
to a particular circumstance, which is part of what enables different people in different circumstances to find themselves in the eye of the text. Um, this is something that Patrick Miller was one of the early people to write about. I'm not sure where that idea was first expressed, um, but I think it's actually quite quite important. So yes, I agree, childlessness, other sufferings, loneliness, mental anguish, there's all kinds of ways that one could hear what goes on here. I don't want to weaken or mitigate the power of this text for people suffering from chronic physical illness, but I certainly don't think it needs to be limited to that. So I, 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 I accept that comment entirely. I wonder if perhaps we can um, have an interplay between questions in the chat and if anyone wants to perhaps speak out a question or a comment, uh, please feel free to do that. And that leads, leaves us with that open-endedness that you were speaking of. Thank you so much, Rabbi Held. I really- uh, Thank you. There's so much to take uh, with us from this. And um, so I'll hand over to Erica to uh, give us news of upcoming events and sign us off. Thank you, Georgina. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for this reflection on Psalm 88. What a wonderful presentation. Uh, next month, please join us on the 18th of May to hear the Right Reverend Martin Gorick, Bishop of Dudley and patron of the Oxford Interfaith Forum, speak on the topic of Psalm 132, A Song of Ascents. Um, special thanks also to the founder and organizer of this event, uh, Thea Gomolari, who will, who will email you with more details and a registration link and continued blessings for everyone this year. Thank you for joining us.